Can you start, please, by defining pluralism and explaining why it is so important, especially in today's global environment? Sure. Um, you know, pluralism feels like a big, uh, a big word and often something theoretical. I know um, a lot of people don't really feel like they can grasp it. But at its heart, it's really the positive response to diversity and difference in our societies. It's about belonging. It's about our own belonging and mutual recognition and respect of others and how we navigate that in every different aspect of our society, from media to governance, to just the way that we work together in our own communities. It sounds so wonderful. And it sounds almost like utopia in a way. So is it possible? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I think when we look at societies around the world, I couldn't point you to a purely pluralistic society. And so in many ways, this is aspirational. This is something we are trying to get to. And we're really not naive to understanding how difficult this is. It's difficult to deal with difference, to difference of opinion, difference of um, culture, needs, language, religion, um, perspectives on how life should be managed and run in our everyday lives. All of us struggle with how we ourselves engage with people who have different views than we do. But I think that in our current historical global moment, it's maybe harder than it's ever been. And, and you know, let's talk about that current political climate where we're seeing a lot of polarizing and divisive narratives, not to mention just flat out untruths, mistruths, uh, disinformation, misinformation. It's just it goes on and on. So what alternatives can leaders and communities adopt to foster this more inclusive society? Well, I know you'll be posting this on social media, but I do think that um, social media is a challenge to us right now, that we're not, in fact, engaging with one another when we engage on social media. We're not, in fact, sitting down and having a conversation and listening to someone and really trying to understand what they think, why they think what they think, what they need, how they might see the world and experience the world differently. And if we did that, we could actually learn a lot about ourselves and about what our society needs to be better and richer. And I think when we do have those conversations, and I would argue that you and probably all of your listeners have those conversations in different moments in their lives, and they're transformative ones. But too often now, those kinds of discussions are rare when we're barraged by, as you say, divisive narratives online, misinformation, not knowing who to trust. I think the other thing I would say when I think about where pluralism does work, where we have seen really positive engagement, is that there is trust. There is a willingness to spend the time to create spaces where people can talk about these different things in ways where they're not necessarily feeling that there's going to be an attack at the end of the conversation, that they're able to explore differences together and come through that in a way that at the end of a discussion, everyone feels more like they belong. Everyone feels more like they recognize the person across the table for being a whole person and not just a stereotype of what social media may tell them that they are. And often on times online, I mean, I know I'm guilty of it. I will just block somebody and remove them from my feed because I don't want to hear what they're saying or or listen. And that doesn't eliminate the person. It just takes them out of my social media feed. And it's addressed nothing in terms of the discourse that's happening out there uh, right now. So the excellent points. And, and so the center supports a lot of initiatives and projects that aim to build these more inclusive societies. So can you highlight some of these initiatives and the impact that they've had? Well, we work on a, a range of, of different programs. Now, we're, of course, a global organization that's based um, here in, in Canada, as you mentioned. We're in, we're in Ottawa. We're on unceded Algonquin territory here in Ottawa. Um, we do a lot of work trying to help societies actually measure pluralism and figure out how you make it visible so that people can figure out what is working in their societies and what's not. And so that can be everything from um, engaging uh, with Indigenous and Afro-descendant women leaders in Colombia who are using 
uh, traditional territorial knowledge, indigenous knowledge to transform how people are understanding the peace agreement in Colombia and how that's being implemented and how it's affecting the communities um, who are really the most conflict affected and really the, the real leaders at the heart of the peace process in Colombia. Um, we do a lot of work on education. When you think also about how we're thinking about building skills for the next generation of leaders in our society to be able to engage with difference, to be able to engage with difference in this particularly polarized time, in this social media space. We need to build the muscles of young people to engage with these complicated conversations in a way that gets them through the other side, stronger as a collective society that's confident in its own difference and diversity. Diversity is a really beautiful, beautiful thing, but in a lot of places and spaces, what we see is that it has been weaponized and people see that as something dangerous that they don't want to engage in. So a lot of our work with educators, with education leaders, and with the entire ecosystem around an education space is to try to help people see that they can, they can lean into these conversations. But as I said earlier, that also requires a lot of trust building. And so a lot of these processes are not quick. There isn't an overnight solution for us to get across these, across these divisions. There is one other program that I think we're going to to speak about. So maybe I'll just. Um, uh, yeah, that's is, well, you're leading me right to it because that's my, <laughs> my next question. Uh, so the, the Global Center for Pluris, Pluralism presents the Global Pluralism Award every two years. So can you tell us about the award and the impact it's having on promoting pluralism? Well, one of the reasons that we set up the award is that this is a huge topic that we're talking about, and it looks different in different places. And so we felt when we began as an organization that sometimes demonstrating pluralism is easier than defining it. So you can point to examples and say, this is a space in a community where, for example, history educators are coming together and saying, we want a trauma-informed, conflict-sensitive way to talk about our histories of conflict across different ethnic communities. And then other educators can look at that and see the possibilities in their own spaces. So we established the award. This is the the fourth cycle that we're going into. So we're, we now have 40 laureates in order to amplify the incredible work around the world of individuals and organizations that are working to champion pluralism. So can you share some of the exam examples of the work that these laureates are doing and, and maybe share a couple of the nominees this year? Sure. So we have our 10 finalists and we're just in the process of announcing the three winners. And we'll have a big um, ceremony with them in November here in Ottawa. This year, every year, it's a really diverse mix. But one of the things I'm um, excited about this year is that we have a really um, strong theme around peace and dialogue among all of our winners. And similarly, a really phenomenal um, group of women and organizations that are really working around empowerment of women and women's leadership in different spaces. So for one example, um, Esther Omam is a community peace builder, humanitarian and human rights defender from Cameroon, who has been working to facilitate dialogue between communities in Cameroon with young people and women across religious divides and with the government and, and some of the non-state armed actors in that conflict. And again, really crossing over so many of the different divides and divisions that Cameroon itself is really struggling with. And she's a real example of trying to weave those spaces together. Another, again, another woman, uh, phenomenal uh, young woman peace builder in uh, Lebanon, Leah Baroudi, uh, had founded an organization called March that works up in Tripoli in northern Lebanon and works across, again, across lines with very divided communities with really creative approaches. She set up a drama troupe with ex-combatants that works specifically on thinking through some of the different issues within the society through the arts. So again, it doesn't always have to be sitting down and having the tough conversation about the issue at a table. It can be through arts and culture. She set up a cafe to bring communities across divides together. And similarly, um, another of our um, of our laureates this year, Reform, is a Palestinian organization that's based in the West Bank, operates both in um, the West Bank and, and obviously Gaza is particularly difficult for them to be operating in. They have operated in Gaza and continue to support work 
there as they can. And they, again, work on a range of different social cohesion and peace building activities across Palestinian society. I think one of the things that, that is really striking to me in the work that they do is recognizing that division is really endemic when you're in a conflict situation. It is hard to move across lines. So if you're a Palestinian refugee or someone who's living inside the West Bank, you will have different experiences of the conflict itself. And so even across those sort of internal differences within Palestinian society, understanding differences that may be seen between um, young people and the older generation in Palestinian society, or gender differences and the importance of women as leaders and peacemakers within Palestinian society. So they work, again, on a range of different peace building and social cohesion activities there and are really building what I was describing before is the sort of community of trust, of building safe spaces where people can come across different divides and have these kinds of conversations and really support leaders within within their own community. So we're really, really excited and really proud to be recognizing them this year. Can you walk us through how the nominees are selected and the role of the independent jury in this process? So we have a call for nominations um, at the beginning of the cycle, and that goes out around the world. So we really encourage listeners, if you can think of somebody in your community, watch our space. It's going to be coming up. We have an independent um, international jury that is currently chaired by Dr. Marwan Washer, um, former foreign minister of, of Jordan. There's a number of eminent people on the jury, and they spend a lot of time deliberating with um with a larger selection of, of a short list. We do an enormous amount of due diligence, including on, on the final 10, and we do in-person site visits to each to really get under the hood and, and ensure that they are exemplifying pluralism in all their areas of work. And, and you're, as a notable peace builder, what advice do you have for leaders and communities on how they can process pain and address injustice in a way that promotes pluralism? Well, I think one of the first things to say is that it is important to open these spaces for dialogue and discussion within your own communities and your own spaces. It's hard when you don't necessarily have a foundation of trust. And so finding leaders in with whom different actors feel that they can be authentic, that they can raise those voices, I would say try to do it offline try to have real human conversations in these moments. I would say pause and take a breath. It's important to acknowledge the trauma. I think it's also important to acknowledge that sometimes trauma is so intense that it's very difficult for you to acknowledge the trauma of others. It's hard in these moments to do that. And it won't happen overnight. And we need to continue to have these conversations. At a global level, we need to find a way of de-escalating this kind of rhetoric to ensure that grief is not being weaponized in terms of a space of vengeance, because that will really only continue a cycle of trauma and it holds back dialogue. What we need right now more than anything is peacemakers to step into this space of leadership and be empowered to be leading these kinds of conversations in all of our spaces, in Canada, certainly in Israel and Gaza and the wider region and around the world. Well, I know my audience, and I know that there are a lot of peacemakers listening who would love to know more. Are there opportunities to volunteer with you, work with you? Well, there's certainly, we work with partners around the world. So there's definitely um, partnership opportunities. We don't um, take volunteers, um, unfortunately, but um, I would really encourage people to get in touch with us. Um, you go to our website, just pluralism.ca. Um, I didn't say the nicest things about social media, but you can follow us on Instagram, <laughs> pluralism, or at least get in touch. Um, we really like having human conversations. So um, great if people want to want to get in touch with us too. And I went on the website and I was down a rabbit hole. Very impressive uh, board that you have. Maybe mm -hmm. you can share some of the people on the board because it is, there's a lot of gravitas there. Well, we were founded originally by the government of Canada and His Highness the Aga Khan. So we're very privileged that His Highness the Aga Khan um, is the chair of the board. Um, on the Canadian side, for your listeners, um, uh, the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson, our former Governor General, of course, is on the board, as is um, the Right Honourable Beverly McLaughlin, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So again, when you speak about women's leadership um, on, on your show, I think we're particularly privileged to have such phenomenal women leaders. And I would say that we're privileged to have you in Canada. So I'm thrilled to have uh, found you and I can't thank you enough for joining me. So one more time, if you could share the website and maybe uh, the Instagram handle of the Global Center for Pluralism. 
Sure. We're at uh, pluralism.ca and uh, at Global Pluralism on Instagram and other social media. All right, Meredith, it's been a pleasure meeting you, but this will not be the last time we're definitely going to talk again. Thank you for joining me today. All right. Thanks so much for having me, Kendall.